Times installed the Applegarth Press and that could print the news even faster, up to 5,000 uh, pages an hour. Um, that meant they could go to press even later, that they could print uh, such a lot of copies that the unit cost of each paper was very, very low and they could afford to, to sell it very cheaply. The main cost of the times in 1827 would still have been the stamp duty that had to be paid on it. So, of course, the paper itself was campaigning for the abolition of that. So by the time you reach the 1830s, when stamp duty is very low, and finally in 1850, when there's no stamp duty at all, the Times is very, very cheap, but very, very profitable. Circulation went up and up and up. So went up from 5,000 copies in 1850 when the presses were installed, 15,000 copies in 1834 when stamp duty was reduced, then up to something between 18 and 20,000 copies in 1840, 23,000 copies in 1844, 40,000 copies by 1851. So the circulation was 10 times bigger. Uh, and so the advertising revenue would have been you know, because the population was growing and the wealth of the population was growing, the value of that would have gone up not by 10 times, but let's say 50 or 100 times. The paper was tremendously profitable. They could invest in not only the best technology and the best means of printing and distribution, but shock horror in journalists. So the, the, the whole creation of the profession of journalism uh, comes about at this time because the Times can now invest in the content and really help to create the profession of journalism as we know it. So under the editorship of Thomas Barnes, um, who edit, edited the paper uh, through uh, the early decades of the 19th century, and then above all under the editorship of John Delane, uh, who became the editor of the paper at age 23 in 1841, um, the professionalism of the professionalism of journalism was established. Um, the people writing for the paper were no longer commercial hacks or political propagandists, but they did attempt to tell the news um, pretty straight without uh, turning it into simple commercial or, uh, or political propaganda. I mean, Daniel Defoe, who'd been a journalist, uh, just just wrote nonsense about, you know, how there were islands on the other side of the world where streets were paved with gold and he would back scam investment schemes to go and, you know, get ships to go and steal this gold or what have you. Uh, the, the Times was more objective, it, you know, it based its stories on evidence. Um, it, was, it was basically identified with liberalism, political liberalism in the broadest sense, uh, of um, low taxation, economic expansion, freedom of speech, uh, and only moderate imperialism. Um, but it was absolutely politically in in independent. And uh, Delane went to efforts to establish this principle we now have in journalism of balance and political independence. Um, support for the government of the day um, was given... Um, only temporarily, that was his phrase, that he, he lent the support of the paper to a political party in an election that he approved of. Uh, it wasn't a campaigning newspaper as the old um, uh, London Standard had been. The Standard had been established in 1827 as a straightforward conservative propaganda sheet, specifically to oppose Catholic uh, emancipation. Uh, and the old uh, Morning Chronicle had been uh, the, you know, the mouthpiece of the Whig faction in Parliament before the Reform Act. The Times was different. Um, it was unpredictable in its political stance. Uh, the whole idea of the leader article that we now have, you know, the editorial, as some people call it, uh, where the editor would pronounce sometimes in favour of one party and then sometimes in favour of another party, a particular legislation was established by Delane at this time uh, for the Times. And then he had in his office there serried rows of uh, professional journalists uh, with their green eye shades, as I imagine it, and big quill pens, uh, writing uh, news independently, objectively, which was then taken down into a sort of a factory 
and then printed at high speed on these tremendous uh, rotary steam driven presses so that is you know from the 1840s onwards we're into the age of the times and a new type of uh, professionalism in journalism amazingly the times even trained its journalists another example of this newly professional press was the daily news founded in 1846 it generally supported the liberal party in a broad sense or liberal ideas some radical uh, campaigns as well uh, the editor of that was one charles dickens uh, briefly the daily telegraph was first published in 1855 at a price of tuppence two pence um, the cover price was halved to one pence in 1855 and it became the first penny paper to be published in London uh, penny papers were the mass circulation uh, papers of the later part of the 19th century Sunday newspapers became uh, a phenomena uh, of the press scene from the 1840s onwards uh, these exploited the the fact that even uh, in the factory towns, uh, Sunday was the day of rest. It was the Sabbath day, and people would have time on Sunday to read uh, newspapers. These papers specialised in long, lurid uh, accounts of trials, particularly gruesome murders. So the daily press was more of a um, necessary sort of purchase that contained uh, news of the day. Uh, the Sunday newspapers... Uh, were more, uh, as it were, languid in their style and used to uh, uh, specialise in, in, in getting a great deal of value out of uh, reams and reams of literal transcripts and, uh, of reporting in the courts. Shorthand, the shorthand writing system very much developed uh, in order to enable that type of journalism to take place. Lloyd's Illustrated newspaper was started in 1842 and only shortly afterwards, the Illustrated London News, um, so, sorry, the Illustrated London News and the Illustrated Paper uh, were both launched in uh, 1842. Uh, the Illustrated London News uh, <coughs> became uh, one of the most widely circulated